How can bread and wine really be Jesus' physical body and blood? Well, magic, obviously. Hocus pocus, hoc est corpus meum. How can it be? Well, in one way, it's a great mystery. Um, it's a great mystery that very much correlates with the mystery of the Incarnation. The Church doesn't want to explain away the mystery. Uh, the Church does want to make sense the best that she can of the mystery. And so we take very seriously Jesus' words in the Gospel of John, that unless you gnaw on my flesh and drink of my blood, you'll have no eternal life within you. And we say, okay, well, this is pretty serious stuff. What's going on here? Now, priests have um, a formation in philosophy, specifically metaphysics, to help us understand what is taking place metaphysically. So while we have um, the, the color of the host, the color of the bread, um, the weight of the bread, clearly bread, and the color of the wine, the liquid wine as a liquid, um, these are the accidents, and what the priest um, is receiving is, in terms of appearance, is bread and is wine. These are the accidents, these are the appearances. However, because the priest has this, this um, well, it comes to a power given to him by the bishop who consecrates him priest, he has the power to transform uh, substantially Right? So the substance of bread and the substance of wine are transformed into a divine substance. And this is why we call it transubstantiation. The substance have changed from bread and wine to the body and blood of Christ. But really, Catholics believe this kind of change is one that only God can do. And that's why we call it a miracle. This being said, we might also like to consider how C.S. Lewis describes miracles in his book on that subject. Miracles, he says, are events which often happen in nature. Only in the particular case of the miracle, unusually quickly or in an unusual way. At the wedding in Cana, for instance, Jesus turned water into wine at the rate of one instant. <laughs> but grapes and yeast can do the same thing at a rate of several months. On another occasion, Jesus skipped a few steps and turned a handful of loaves into enough bread to feed a whole village. But given an oven and the opportunity, any farmer with a handful of seeds can do the same. How can bread and wine possibly turn into body and blood? Well, there is a highly sophisticated yet perfectly natural process by which this happens every day, which some in our society call by the name of eating and drinking. Bread and wine become Jesus' body and blood simply by doing something natural, just in an unusual way. There's another angle of, of looking at what happens when we participate in the Eucharist. Joseph Ratzinger provides this fantastic way of viewing this and he says, he talks about transubstantiation and he explains it in a really beautiful and powerful way, but then what he says, he says, look it, in the bread and the wine, Jesus gives himself, his full self, his whole personhood to us. And that is what the language of flesh and blood is. When we speak of Jesus' flesh and we speak of his blood, we're speaking of his entire person. And so when we receive the Eucharist, we receive the whole person of Christ tangibly presented to us in this round little disc of bread. Now we need to remember that the Passover is one of the central sacred Jewish celebrations. So they are celebrating this event that commemorates the Passover that was first instituted in the book of Exodus. There's the ritual, the Passover ritual that is being celebrated. But what Jesus does, and this is important to remember, while they're celebrating this Passover meal, Jesus is changing the words. When he's taking the bread, he's saying, this is my body. And when he's taking the wine, he's, taking, he's saying, this is my blood. When he says that this is my blood, he is also saying, this is the new covenant. He's made a significant shift from what was said in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, this is the blood, right? The, the blood 
that comes from the slaughtered goat or the slaughtered sheep. But now Jesus is saying this is the blood of the new covenant. He is instituting now the new covenant at the Last Supper. So these words are crucial. What Jesus is saying is crucial. This is not just like some parable or just another event in the life of Jesus. This is crucial because it is in continuity with the um, Passover that we find in Exodus. And these fundamental changes, we can call them fulfillments. Jesus is fulfilling uh, the laws and the prophets by giving us his body and giving us his blood. However, this is still not complete because when he is crucified, there we can speak literally of his physical body and literally of the blood that is gushing from his body. These two events, the Last Supper and the crucifixion, cannot be separated. The Last Supper has its fulfillment on the cross, is completed on the cross. So um, when, the, when the priest says at Mass that we are receiving the body and blood of Christ, he is saying what Jesus taught us. We have not adapted them in any way. We are repeating the words of the Lord as he says, do this in memory of me. When we speak of Jesus' flesh and we speak of his blood, we're speaking of his entire person. And so when we receive the Eucharist, we receive the whole person of Christ tangibly presented to us in this round little disc of bread. And what's so potent about this is that the, the, the Eucharist, it's not a panacea. It doesn't solve all our problems, it's not a magic pill, but it's a person. And so we as persons have to prepare ourselves to receive the Eucharist. And that's why it's so important that we discern the body. We know what we're doing when we receive the Eucharist because we were encountering God. It's this unbelievable moment in which one can so easily overlook that we are encountering my finite creatureliness is encountering the divine, the infinite in his whole person. And so I prepare myself to receive him. And so I can be prepared to receive the Eucharist and be transformed because I am encountering the person and I'm wanting to receive the person and I'm opening myself to receive the person of Christ. Or I can close myself down in the same way that we do in relationships, that we can sit before another, pretend we're listening and not receive that person whatsoever. And so this is why the church prepares us in the liturgy um, through the worship, through the silence, through the prayers, to be, be in the right spot, to be oriented correctly, to receive the full personhood of Christ.